forge this Prop 215, one of the greatest laws written in humankind. Scott Imler is here, who was a part of writing Prop 215. And tonight's about honoring the Compassionate Use Act and the grassroots activism. So, Buddy Doozy will be speaking later, and he was old friends of Jack Harris, and Jack left Buddy a job of helping run an organization. Tonight, it, the real purpose of the event is to educate ourselves about the upcoming Proposition 64, also known as the Adult Use of Marijuana Act. And it's to educate ourselves in hopes that once we understand it, that we can work vociferously to defeat it. So the main function of tonight's meeting is to educate ourselves about this initiative and to work hard and strategize how to defeat it. The third, you know, hopeful point of the night would be to not only protest and try to reject a bad law, but also be proactive and promote in 2018 what we feel is a comprehensive solution to this cannabis issue. And that comprehensive solution is, of course, the initiative, the California Cannabis Hemp Initiative. So this event, we are a speaker series. We'd like to organize similar events across the country, across California, to defeat this law. But we are a speaker series. This is the first one. And again, thanks everyone for coming out on a Saturday night when we could all be, you know, doing other stuff. So we want to, you know, as a third point, make sure everyone understands about our future initiative. The hope is, with the third point, that if we can defeat, whether or not even we can defeat this bill, um, the, the Sean Parker Proposition 64, we're going to go for our initiative in 2018, even if ALMA becomes law. So we want to familiarize everyone in this room who is mostly familiar with our solution to be proactive. So on that note, in honoring great, root, great grassroots activists like Dennis Perone, John, and his husband John in Whistle, who will be showing up around 7.30, I want to honor another activist by the name of Bernie Sanders. Now, Bernie, whether or not anyone you know, supported his specifics of the campaign, he came out to California and he took our state on by a storm. He organized rallies and he brought a social movement together, a social movement of, of social justice. He's continuing what the Occupy movement and helping triangulate a lot of different social movements together. So, what I'm, in honoring Bernie coming out to California, putting on these massive rallies, with our quest to def defeat this law, we need to model ourselves similar to Bernie in organizing throughout the state and in fact eventually hoping to have mass rallies against this law. So Bernie was a model for us to continue this social rep justice revolution and that's where I'm going to phase into uh, introducing the first speaker. Angela Davis talked uh, uh, to, about the great leader Angela Davis about how radical really means going, taking something out by the root. So we as activists need in our cannabis movement to take this movement back and take it back to our hands, reclaim our medicine, and basically radicalize our cannabis movement. And radicalize nowadays is you know, being used as a negative word, but radicalize meaning we need to go back to the roots of where this movement started and honor those like Dennis and Scott and others who have helped forge us to be where we are. So we need to reclaim our plan. This movement against the Sean Parker Initiative and for Jack Herr, the California Hemp Initiative, is a movement for social justice. 
defeating this law, when we rush to the, on November 8th to vote, this isn't a vote against legalization, but this is a vote against corporate control, against more government and more corporations trying to control our lives. For instance, under the Sean Parker Initiative, they allow for industrial hemp, but a very low THC is at 1%. 0.3%. So um, this, these corporations want to control industrial hemp, 0.3% for a plant. And this is what they're calling legalization. Six plants. If you grow seven, you still go to jail. This is what they call legalization. The issue is control, and the issue is we, as social justice activists and medical marijuana, cannabis activists, and as activists for ending the drug war and for ending mass incarceration, and for sustainable energy, we don't want corporations to con more control. We don't want to give the government more control of our lives, really. So this issue of rushing to vote against this bill is an issue not against legalization, but it's an issue of giving corporations more control over our lives and over plants and over the earth. And so the quicker and the faster we can move this resistance against pro. 64 is a social justice movement like our great forebearers like Angela Davis and other activists and bring this in to the broader context that this is about social control for the elite. The elite are the ones that funded this. This was funded by billionaires that are trying to control a new market. Now Bernie, his whole mantra was against corporatism. We here in California have an ultimate example of corporatism. We have these corporations that wrote the Sean Parker Initiative, the Adult Use Marijuana Act, so that they can somewhat control of the, this unruly industry. And they are shutting it down our throats. The people that wrote this bill did not consult Dennis Perone or any of the, the OG activists in the movement. They could have supported Dale Sky Jones. They could have supported in the reform Initiative. Of course, they could have supported the Jack Hare Initiative. But they, they're trying to shove this Sean Parker Initiative down our throats. They didn't ask hardly anyone. And this is an example of George Soros and Sean Parker and these billionaires and millionaires trying to shove down our throats what they view and what, what they want for legalization, which means they get the whole pot, not just part of it. But So that is my, you know, um, the three main points are we want to educate everyone about this bill, work, you know, tirelessly to resist the bill, and then promote the solution, which in our, in Buddy and I's opinion, is the 2018 initiative, the, the California Cannabis Hemp Initiative, and the California Cannabis Hemp Initiative, we can talk about later in the evening, however, in the short sentences, it's going to protect, honor, and sanctify Prop 215, protect it, but it's going to totally end the prohibition of cannabis at the same time. So, I would like to introduce my first, or our first speaker, and this is a gentleman who's been a part of a local movement in, against a corporate control or against over-regulation for cannabis, and Patrick is one of the founders of the Cannabis Advocates Alliance. They've been working tirelessly to have sensible regulation for medical cannabis. They have been working in defense of small and medium cannabis farmers who care about what they do, and their ethos is great, and I'm happy to have Patrick, you know, of the, C the, the Cannabis Advocates Alliance to join us. Thank you. Um, I think it's really a blessing and appropriate that I'm able to stand here right now at this time at, um, you know, unfortunately not a 2016 CCHI rally, but a stop Prop 64 rally. But the, the beautiful thing is I want to talk about how um, CCHI specifically makes ripples in the pond beyond its success as its primary goal of getting CCHI on the ballot. Because
because around two, maybe around a little <laughs> over two years ago, um, there, Mikey had on a Saturday like today a uh, CCHI 2016, still at that point, maybe 2014, but um, rally. And at that rally, at that same time, we were experiencing this county um, kind of the first of the cultivation grow band waves that was coming through. And we had gone through a, a situation with other political cannabis organizations in town where people had lost trust because there was winners and losers in a you know, dispensary ordinance. And there was really no organization, grassroots or not, for anybody to participate in, in the cannabis uh, you know, movement at that moment in Sanders. And Mikey and CCHI, a state issue, brought us together to talk about a local issue. And that local conversation about how are we going to preserve uh, the, the freedoms that we fought and won for and people have fought for to bring us in 215 and as to, since 215 has been passed, people have fought to establish. And how are we going to preserve this in the face of all these new challenges in the form of regulations, right? And so on the... <coughs> On the local level, we were facing a grow ban. Um, the organization um, that came out of Mikey's first CCHI meeting, we called Cannabis Advocates Alliance. We had a ton of weekly unruly meetings in mostly these rooms um, that were, were really just people who didn't know what to do getting together. And out of those meetings, um, other groups formed who had more of a specific idea of what their goals were and people from who were at those original CCHI meetings and who had come on to these chaotic C or CAA meetings of people just getting together and really like venting and talking about their frustrations with the situation participated in gathering um, over 13,000 signatures to stop that cultivation ban that the county had passed um, and that our organization had kind of formed in an emergency situation out of Mikey's uh, meeting that he had thrown. And, uh, you know, Mikey himself gathered signatures to stop that and it, you know, it was a ribble in the pond from this CCHI meeting, right? And so, in our, in our local struggle as it went on, we came into, as the timeline progressed, we came into a new situation when the, uh, the state legislature had passed new rules. And we call it, we start, you know, those MRSA regulations, the three bills that came together, um, really sent uh, a new sense of emergency through the community. And because we started looking at those and we are starting to say, well, how does this beautiful thing that we have called Prop 215 and the emerging, you know, industries and new freedoms that we have going to fit into this model? And I still don't know the answer to that at all. Um, and, but we, it was, became a new challenge to work on. And just like the, the grow band was a challenge for us that, that, we all came together and we didn't know how we were going to get out of it and we got out from under that and into the new challenge of working with the county, developing the right kind of regulations that would work to not just preserve Prop 215 and the freedoms we have under that, but protect them from this new state set of regulations that were coming down on us. And so, you know, I, I said at a CCHI rally a couple years ago, maybe now, that, you know, forever it was about if you just cultivated and you just did as much as you can to keep this movement going and advocate for kind of this abstract concept kind of legalization, that was doing your part. I guess, in some ways. And as that abstract idea of legalization comes down and turns into regulation, and then it becomes the question of not legalizing, but what kind of legalization are you going to have? And so 
we started working on that very real problem in, at the county level because of this, uh, you know, referendum we did on a grow ban. They formed an ad hoc committee that I served on painfully, and you got I got an up close vision of how really these laws get made and really the huge limitations that you have on just the local political system as is, let alone dealing with new framework from the state and beyond. So in that process, we had you know many things that are not ideal and anyone who looks at, I won't get into the details of the local cultivation ordinance, but anyone who's looked at that can you know, probably talk for an hour about the problems with it. Um, but some of the things that got into that that wouldn't have gotten into it if it wasn't for the ripple of the pond of Nike's meeting that I'm semi-proud of is, you know, we took a couple votes that, uh, we took votes on a lot of issues, but one of the votes at the end that we took on uh, was to ban GMO cannabis in the county. So in this ordinance, even though it is not the kind of law that we need or the kind of regulation that we need, there is a GMO ban that made it into that process because of the ripples in the pond of Mike. So, you know, we have, we have that small victory. Also, there was a, a unanimous vote. It hasn't materialized yet because this ordinance is not final. Um, but a, a commitment from the county to provide medicine for low or no income patients. And that's also something that wouldn't have been in there if it wasn't for that organization that came out of the ripples of the pond of, you know, this movement. And so it's a, there, the, the point is, is that this, just as these things come down and we get setbacks or we don't get a victory in the way that we, you know, first intended to, like with CCHI not being on the ballot this year, um, it doesn't mean that there's not big, big things that have been accomplished because of this, you know, specific movement and the movement in general. And then it also doesn't mean that there's not a million positive things that we can work for both on a local level and at the state level in the future. You know, I heard Mikey saying that, you know, 64 or not, CCHI 2018 needs to go forward. And, you know, I would agree with that in a major way because, you know, the, the situation that we have with the new state regulations rolls back a lot of Prop 215 on its own. Something needs to be done at that level. Um, we're trying to work at a local level to mediate the you know effect of that and try to get good small little victories, but that's about, the, there's some major limitations on the local level. Um, people are working at the state through the legislature trying to work with regulators to try to make things somehow fit into this MRSA radio thing or the MRSA framework, but there's major, major uh, limitations to that as well. And so we need to build a movement, like Mikey is talking about, that is able to possibly pass something in 2018 through a ballot measure, put more pressure on our local political apparatus to do its part in preserving and expanding freedom. Um, and relation to cannabis, medical cannabis, and, you know, cannabis in general, adult use, whatever you want to call it. And then we also need to be able to have that organization put pressure on the regulators so that if we do get a good bill passed through the, uh, you know, legislation that is put in place properly, that if we do get good systems in place locally that they, you know, are, lis are listened to and fit into these state systems and that if we have power to do uh, you know, a people's initiative, like the Jack Bill, that it then won't get fought and tied up in that legislative thing. And so that political movement that is, in my mind, much bigger than cannabis. And so over something that's also happened for me personally as a ripple of, you know, Mikey's first meeting is that this made me comfortable. I feel like cannabis and myself have always played a, you know, um, behind the scenes or periphery role in this like radical politics and movement that Mike talks about. And for me coming to that meeting, standing up in the same position, speaking to people.
people and it showed me that you know the time has come as we've moved out into this argument about what kind of regulation that we're going to have that we are out and we are involved in the process and the rules of cannabis and there's a lot of other rules and things that are involved in this governmental process that we need to influence as well not just cannabis policy so I've been able to you know kind of convert some of the people and connections I've met through the county uh, working with the county and the people that I've worked with just at throwing meetings over and over to kind of become involved in other issues. There's the, the local bus system, the Santa Cruz Metro um, was having, facing 30% cuts. Um, myself and some other people got involved in that issue and, you know, made some progress with works and coalitions with a bunch of other people. Um, and we recently have become involved with a city council candidate, um, Drew Glover is a project pollinate, works for the Resource Center for Nonviolence. And I really see if we're going to form this movement that Mikey talks about, we need to become a part of this broader social movement that has existed and is the very reason we have the medical cannabis laws that we have, and is the very reason why you know, Val was able to start and chose Santa Cruz as the home to you know, start this movement for providing patients with you know, free medicine, and then the reason why Dennis was able to do it in the Bay Area and things is because that, that political uh, movement, that like of progressivism, radical politics, whatever you wanted, was, was here from the 60s in the social movement, and it was there before that in you know, the civil rights movement and the labor movement before that, and cannabis was made illegal in a very way to criminalize those pop, you know, people who were involved in radical politics and minority groups, you know, and it's been used to stigmatize these issues, stigmatize these people, and the reason that it's a social movement is because it's, you know, it's tied up in the heart of our drug war, it's tied up in the heart of all sorts of the, the darker chapters of our history and the places where they started taking a stand against that, you know, the Bay Area and Santa Cruz and these people settled were also because of those radical politics or those progressive politics open to a change in relation to how we treat cannabis, you know, and so that's why our movement settled here and there's good reasons that why we play the periphery or background role, but now's the time for us to get involved if we're going to be able to create cannabis. Um, you know, we have a, an interesting, horrible dilemma of that we need a law that opens it up to the right people but keeps the wrong groups out, mega corporations. And if we can do that, that's a law that maybe has never been seen on earth before. And so that could be useful to how we relate to other products and uh, our laws about other things. So, so you know, I, I'm really excited about the future. Um, I'm glad that we're still here talking about CCHI in the face of Alma um, and 64. You know, I, I can't vote for Prop 64 at all. I can't tell people to go out and vote for it. But all I can say is that win or lose, the next day I'm going to be engaged in this issue. And if Prop 64 passes, I'm going to go to the local county and say, okay, now are you taking the burden, the tax burden off patients because we have adult use? Now are you opening up for more permits? Now are you doing this? Now are you doing that? How much of this tax money is going to go to patients? How much is it going to go for real drug prevention, where, what are we going to do here with our money to not get engaged in the situation. So uh, that's about all I have to say. Um, thank you. Um, come back. I have a, C, a CAA Cannabis Advocates Alliance email list if no one's on that yet. If, um, sign up for it. I also, if you're in the city or from Santa Cruz area, come find out about the Drew Glover campaign. It's not just about him. It's the beginning of trying to take back, not take back, but, you know, give back Santa Cruz to, you know, the normal people, and that's what we need to have um, here, because we're all in danger of losing the ability to live here, no matter how much you make right now, it's
it's going to be tough in the future, and we're all stuck in the same traffic every day, and we're all living in the same bubble we call the environment. So we need to, cannabis rules or not, we need to get involved in this bigger picture stuff. So thank you. Come find out about Drew and get on the list. Thank you. So that is Pat from Cannabis Advocates Alliance, and what a good, good guy that is. Guy, what a freedom fighter the group is. CAA, make sure uh, that you have, you know, if you're, make sure you're on the the sign up sheet for those that aren't. We have two sign up sheets going. So, so yeah, we were thinking the gentleman running for city council might say a few words. Um, Buddy's going to speak next, and, but Scott, if you'd like to say a few words before Buddy, I'd love for you to come up. <laughs> um, this is an old friend of mine, Scott Hendler. He was involved with, you know, helping author Prop 215, but before that, our local initiative here in Santa Cruz to make medical cannabis available to patients, it was this local initiative um, along with the one Dennis had done before, which helped spawn Prop 215. Scott came from, from Los Angeles, and I'm honored to have him. Scott Emler. It was great to be back. It's been a long time I left. Dan Cruz in autumn of 1995 to organize the Southern California Signature Gathering Campaign for Prop 215. As I said, um, I got involved in 1991 with medical marijuana. I was growing uh, pot up in Zianti in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And uh, got a big bunch of camp helicopter landing in the backyard and liberated my garden. And um, I called Dennis Brown, who I'd known for many years in San Francisco. He was kind of the prince of pot in his cast from his right there. And um, I said, I think I need a lawyer. They just came and took my plans and said, no, you don't need a lawyer, you need a petition to do a medical marijuana initiative in Santa Cruz, like we've done here in San Francisco with Proposition P. That seven weeks later passed with 80% of the vote. Um, we did that, uh, we wrote an ordinance called Measure A for um, the county of Santa Cruz, and it was on the 92 ballot with Clinton and Perot and Bush, and got 77%. We followed that up with more local organizing. Um, Valerie Corral, during the course of the campaign, once we were qualified for the ballot, she got busted that September of 1996. And she came to see us, and her, she kind of became one of the poster children for the prop, or the measuring campaign. And in, it was around April 1st, in 93, Art Danner, the district attorney, decided he wasn't going to file charges against her based on uh, his perception that she met the requirements for a necessity claim. Necessity, the easy way to think of it is, is I stole the vote because the guy was drowning. Through those emergency circumstances, my life is that they stealing the vote is in a crime. And the courts actually ruled that you're not found guilty of a crime and then let off. They ruled there was no crime in the first place. Bob Randall, who was the first national medical marijuana patient, he had glaucoma, he lived in Washington, D.C., he was busted in 1978 for three plants growing on his back desk. Uh, he went into federal court in the D.C. district and made the first medical necessity claim for marijuana use. And the federal court determined that you would have to be insane not to break the marijuana law in order to save your eyesight. He was going blind from glaucoma. And he is the one who pretty much established the doctrine of necessity as a means for people to meet their own medical needs while facing an emergency, a life-threatening emergency, and not be guilty of a crime. We continued, we continued to 